But let's, uh, let's look at Luke chapter 23. Let's look at verses 1 through 5 together here as we continue our verse-by-verse -verse study. I'll read verses 1 through 5, introduce our, our subject, move into a few things, and then, as I said, I'll be turning you to John 18 and then returning to chapter 23 here in Luke. But let's begin reading together. Luke 23, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 5. Luke, Luke writes, Then the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Then Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him and said, It is as you say. So Pilate said to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no fault in this man. But they were the more fierce, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. Well, as we begin, let's remind ourselves that the Lord Jesus Christ has been taken before the high priest, a man by the name of Caiaphas, and stood before Caiaphas, the high priest, and the Jewish religious council called the Sanhedrin. Now, you see that in Luke chapter 22, just previous to these verses, verses 66 through 71. And so, as Jesus had stood before this uh, religious body of men, they had begin, begun to, to question him with the intent of formulating a, a charge against him. And the charge that they want to formulate is a capital charge. They want, in other words, to be able to formulate a charge that demands the death penalty. So that's what has been taking place up to this point. And so as he has stood before them, and they've asked enough questions, they finally feel that they have enough on him to make that charge. And, and so they take him before a man by the name of Pontius Pilate. That's what chapter 23, verse 1 begins by telling us. It says, a whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. Now, they wait until daybreak in order that they might reconvene the Sanhedrin because according to the Jewish law, rabbinic law, well, rabbinic law states that trials that lead to the death penalty have to be conducted during the day. And so they waited until daybreak in order to do that. So it's now morning. And they're able to proceed with their plan in order that they might have him executed. And so that's what he says. The whole multitude of them arose, and they led him to Pilate. Now, it says in verse 2, they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation, forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And so they bring him to a man by the name of Pontius Pilate. And uh, that's exactly what Jesus had said was going to take place. If you remember it, in Mark chapter 9, at verse 31, uh, the Bible says that he taught his disciples and said to them, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and uh, after he's killed, he will rise the third day. And so he had told them this was going to take place, and, and so it's basically happening exactly as he said. Now, they take him to a man by the name of Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate was a Roman governor. He governed over that particular area from the year 26 to 36 A.D. Now, as a governor, he had, uh, he had various kinds of authority and power. Uh, he had financial responsibilities. He, he also had what would be called judicial power. And, and when you read history, uh, the little history that we really have on Pontius Pilate, you find that, that he's a picture of a carnal politician because what he wants to do is get certain things done without personal sacrifice. And so we'll see that ultimately he yields to pressure because his own position becomes threatened. When you read about him, though, some historians write that he was inflexible, that he was merciless, and he was a stubborn ruler. And the Jews hated him. The Jews ordinarily would have had nothing to do with Pontius Pilate, but he, he fit into their plans. You'll see this in just a moment. But they hated him. They hated him because his administration was very severe towards them. When we were looking in, in the Gospel of Luke, for example, in chapter 13, remember at verse 1 how, how Luke had said there were present at that season, some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Pontius Pilate was hated by the Jews. They wanted nothing to do with him. And though he was hated, 
the authorities have no problem taking Jesus to him because they need to bring Jesus to Pontius Pilate in order that they might bring charges or accusations against him. And they do that. They bring accusations against him. And, and you see their accusations here in verse 2 when it says, We found this fellow perverting the nation, forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ the king. And so what you have there is their, uh, their secular charges. It's actually uh, broken into three basic charges. They're saying basically this. They're saying this is a man who uh, is perverting the nation. They're saying that this is a man who uh, says that you should not pay taxes to Caesar. And thirdly, this is a man who calls himself Christ, and that means that he is a king. And so they're hoping that Pilate is going to see this as serious enough to warrant the death penalty. He is receiving, and you'll see this in a moment, he's actually receiving charges from two different angles. One is secular, but the other is religious. Now, when you consider what they said, it's easy to refute those charges. One, Jesus didn't come to establish a political kingdom. You'll see this in a moment when we look in John's gospel. He came to establish the kingdom of God. And secondly, he did not forbid paying taxes. He actually, in chapter 20 of Luke, it's recorded here, verse 25, he actually told them to render unto Caesar what is his due. So he never said that they are not to pay taxes. And finally, Jesus never, when speaking to them as they were formulating their charges, ever called himself a king. And so those are false charges that are being leveled against him. But as they're bringing the, this up, Pilate asks them in verse 3, asks them a question. He says, are you the king of the Jews. What he begins with is the secular charge. Are you a king? To understand this better, let's now turn to John chapter 18, and let me show you what's taking place, because Luke doesn't give us all the information, but John does. John chapter 18. Some of you are probably new at opening your Bibles and all, and say, where's John? John's in heaven, but his book is the next one to the right. The Gospel of John, chapter 18. And I'll read to you, because this is what's taking place when Jesus is before the Roman governor, a man by the name of Pontius Pilate, from verse 28. It says, Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. The word praetorium speaks of the hall of judgment. And it was early morning. But they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If we were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It's not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say right, rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. And so thank God that we have four Gospels, and we're able to fill in what Luke was not led to, uh, to record for us, because this is what's taking place. They've led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Hall of Judgment, a place called the Praetorium. It's early morning. And notice with me first and foremost, because I think that this really gives to us a great, a great picture of, of religious hypocrisy. This is a great picture of religious hypocrisy. It says in verse uh, 28, they themselves did not go into the praetorium unless they should be defiled. You see, when you study the law, when you study the Old Testament, you're going to see that there are a variety of laws that the Jews would hold fast to. 
Sometimes we think in terms of the law of Israel, or we'll say the law of Moses. And when we speak concerning the law of Moses, many times people, when you speak to them about the laws and commandments, will speak concerning what are called the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, which means the Ten Words. And they'll speak concerning that. They'll say, oh, yes, I'm aware of the commandments of God. In Exodus chapter 20, God gave to us Ten Commandments. And so people will say that that's what, what the law was all about, the Ten Commandments. But in reality, the Jews followed some 613 specific laws. So it wasn't simply 10 commandments that they were holding fast to. There were 613. And, and when you read through the Old Testament and you see a variety of things that relate to, um, to approaching God and how you come to Him and the offerings and sacrifices that you are to give to Him and, and even your own physical manner in which you approach Him, you discover that there were times when they, they would bathe and there were a variety of things like that that related to it because there was something called ritual defilement. And, and so the Jews would actually have a, 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 a methodology of, of becoming clean in order that they might offer sacrifice. And seeing that this is a high holiday, they don't want to enter into the court of a Gentile. They don't want to enter into a place where he's, he's not kosher. This is an unclean man. And so rather than, than them going into the praetorium, which is defiled by the Gentiles, because Gentiles are not under kosher law, they refuse to go in. To this day, when you go to Israel, you'll go in, we'll take you into kosher restaurants. You know, every place that we stay is kosher. It's, it, it has to be uh, recognized as being ritually clean by by uh, the rabbis. And so we'll bring you in and we'll have our breakfast in places we take you. Very often they are kosher restaurants. They have rabbis who, who walk in and they will certify it. Like we have here in the United States, you have your restaurant A, B, C, you know. The, well, they, they actually have a rating system. If it's kosher, uh, then the, the Orthodox Jew can go in and can uh, partake of a meal. And uh, when we first went there, um, some of my friends who came with us uh, smuggled in some salsa for breakfast, you're not supposed to do that. And, uh, and they've got their salsa and they're putting out their eggs. And uh, yeah, I had to test it to make sure it was kosher myself. But anyway, um, we're really not supposed to have that in there. I didn't know they had it. And one of them dropped the bottle on the ground. And so a waiter has to come to clean it up. It defiles the whole restaurant. And so you can't do that. You, you can't smuggle in your Gentile, no matter how delicious it is, by the way, your Gentile stuff. You can't do that. And all because they have the kosher system. And you still find that to be true in many places, especially in the city of Jerusalem. Kosher restaurants, and it has to meet certain kinds of requirements and all. And so the Jews would not enter in to the place that was defiled by Gentiles who are unclean. And so that's why they will not enter into this hall. They will not walk in because the place may have some form of impurity. And if they were to enter in, they would be uh, unclean and they'd have to separate themselves from all religious ordinances uh, until the evening. That's what it says in Leviticus chapter 15. And so they didn't want to enter in. And so what happens? Well, the Bible tells us in verse 29 that Pilate went out to them. And so he actually is acquiescing. He's yielding to their religious sentimentality. It's interesting, though. They don't want to go into the praetorium lest they should be defiled, but they're more than willing to put to death Jesus Christ. The religious hypocrisy, they are so caught up with their rules and their regulations and the rejection of Jesus, his words, his life, his works. They are so caught up with that that they are blinded completely as to what they're doing so that, once again, just gives to us this, this, uh, this sense of religious hypocrisy uh, that some, unfortunately, may even to this day still struggle with. I remember a guy, this is ancient history. I look out there and maybe one or two of you might remember a guy named Barry McGuire. You don't have to raise your hand if you do. I prob you probably can't because you have arthritis. But anyway, Barry... Barry McGuire uh, was a folk singer, and he sang a song called uh, The Eve of Destruction. I don't know if you've ever even heard that song, The Eve of... How many... Oh, I've got to ask. How many have heard it? Oh, look at you. you got your arms up. Can you bring them down now? Very slowly, I'm sure. <laughs> the Eve of Destruction, right? 
Hate your black neighbor, but don't forget to say grace. He sang about that back in the 60s. Hate your black neighbor, but don't forget to say grace. The Ku Klux Klan starts with prayer. Hypocrisy in the name of God. And it took place then as it does to this day. In the name of God, they are willing to kill the very Son of God, but they don't want to walk into a Gentile place lest they be ritually defiled. That's what's taking place. That's how deep hypocrisy goes in the human heart. The appearance of being religious to the degree that you don't even see what you're about to do. They will not go in. So Pilate, according to verse 29, went out to them. And so he speaks to them. What accusation do you bring against this man? What he wants them to do is clarify their charge against him. They want Jesus dead, so why do you want him dead? Well, verse 30, notice how they dodged the question. They answered and said to him, if he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. They're dodging the question. And seeing that they don't want to clarify, at least at first, they don't want to clarify their charges, well, Pilate basically says, then if you don't want to respond, then I'm not going to respond to you. Verse 31, Pilate said to them, then you take him. Judge him according to your law. And so, if you do not want to take care of the problem by explaining to me what the situation is, take care of it yourself. But their answer reveals their plan. And this is where you finally see that it's really religious in nature. It says, therefore, the Jews said to him, it's not lawful for us to put anyone to death. It's beginning to be revealed that their real desire is to put him to death. And in chapter 19, I'll show you this in verse 7, it comes fully out. John 19, verse 7, the Jews answered him, we have a law, according to our law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. That's their real concern. They understood that Jesus Christ did not come saying, I am just a prophet. They knew that Jesus Christ did not come saying, I'm just a master teacher. They knew that Jesus Christ did not come simply saying, I work miracles. They, didn't, they knew that he was not saying just those things. They knew that Jesus Christ was saying, I am the Son of God. And because of that, that's why they want him to be put to death. That's why they want him to be crucified. Well, Pontius Pilate isn't convinced that Jesus is guilty of their charges. Their hearts are being clearly revealed. They're looking for an execution, and they're not willing to settle for anything less. So when it says in verse 31, it's not lawful for us to put anyone to death, notice verse 32, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. And in reality, what is taking place is crucifixion is going to occur. Now, I'll look at that with you in a second, but what they're doing at that point is what Luke had recorded. They're formulating a legal charge, and the legal charge that they formulate is one of sedition. It's a non-religious charge. The word sedition means to, it, it speaks of conduct or language that incites rebellion against the government. You see, that's what he was saying when they said, we found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Christ the king. So that's really a political charge. He is claiming to be a king. He's saying, do not pay taxes. And it's seditious. He's, he's undermining the authority of the government of Rome. Now, obviously, Pontius Pilate was somebody who had his ear open. He was able to know what was taking place. He had known if Jesus had been making that claim. It's obviously false. He'd have heard of this by now. But what is going to happen is it's going to fulfill the method of which Jesus Christ is going to die, which was prophesied in the Old Testament. You see, the Jews, when the Jews would, would enact capital punishment, the Jews stoned a person to death. And uh, that's how they would enact uh, punishment, especially in the case of blasphemy. They would, they would uh, pick up huge rocks. They'd actually have a pit that you were cast into. Uh, the accusers, those who brought the, the accusation, had the responsibility to be the first to throw the stone at you, and then you would actually be buried under a pile of very large, uh, heavy stones, and they would crush your skull and, and, and basically pulverize you. That's what would happen. Well, that's how the Jews uh, 
would have capital punishment. It was the Romans who brought in crucifixion into Israel in this methodology. Crucifixion, by the way, was a very horrible way to die. Early in history, when you study uh, various nations and the methodologies that they, they brought into torture and death, you, you, you don't have to look very far until you see the Assyrians. The Assyrians were an absolutely bloodthirsty group of people, and, and you see this in Scripture. What they would do is they would, they would take a sapling, they would cut it, they would sharpen it so it looks like pencil that has been sharpened uh, with a razor-sharp uh, pencil lead, if you will, and uh, they would take the prisoner uh, that they were about to execute and they would impale him on, on this very sharpened uh, uh, sapling. And, and they were masters at this to the point where they were able to place the prisoner on this particular torture uh, methodology where the sharpened point of that sapling would rest an inch or two below the heart. And that means you're still alive. And, and you actually, by your own body weight, would slowly but surely be drawn down through gravity until that sharpened edge pierced your heart. And very slowly, you, through your own weight, would impale your own heart. And so you would stay there sometimes for hours until you ultimately succumb to the incredible shock and pain. Well, the, the Romans had taken that concept and actually had refined it so that they could keep you on a cross sometimes for days, not, not just for an hour, two hours, a day, for days, sometimes several days. And it was a very slow method of dying. But the psalmist in Psalm 22, which was written about a thousand years or so before Christ, this particular psalm, Psalm 22 wrote in verses 16 and 17, Dogs have surrounded me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. This was fulfilled in the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, Psalm 22. And so that's what John is referring to when it says here in John chapter 18, 32, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. I want you to notice something. I want you to notice the Christian faith is not just an emotional faith. I want you to see that. It's something that I, I should draw out for just a moment. A lot of times people think, well, I'm a Christian because I feel like one or I'm saved because I feel saved. Christianity, obviously, we do have emotions that, that are uh, tendent to our faith and all of that. Of course, we have the joy of the Spirit and things of that nature. But the bottom line is, is we are the one religious faith on the face of the earth that actually have prophecy. And Jesus Christ fulfilled over 300 specific prophecies that relate to his life, ministry, and death. And so that's why John is letting us know that this actually fulfilled that which was spoken concerning how Messiah would be pierced because that's what took place when Jesus was crucified. Had he died in the Jewish system of capital punishment, that would have been through stoning. But Jesus Christ being brought before a Roman governor brought under Roman law was going to be crucified, fulfilling what was written in Psalm 22. And so as this is taking place, verse 33, uh, Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom's not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world 
that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And so, Pilate wants to determine whether Jesus is a political king or a messianic, messianic king. That helps him to decide if he should continue the trial or, or release him. Mark tells us in chapter 15, he said to him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, it's as you say. So Jesus is standing before Pontius Pilate. Pilate is questioning him. And that's why in verse 34 and 35, it's interesting that though Pontius Pilate is responsible for question, questioning Jesus, I want you to see that Jesus actually interrogates him. Yeah, I, I find it interesting. You know, people are saying things like, you know, if I had a chance to ask God questions, you know, as if God would just be on, you know, God would be on the witness stand, you know. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you, you? I mean, God is on the witness stand. We, you know, we have a book by the, by the name of Job, the book of Job, in which Job, for the majority of the book, is having debate with some would-be comforters and on more than one occasion, Job says, I, I, I wish that I could bring this thing up and, and have my case presented before God. And ultimately, God speaks to Job and, and says, I have a few things to ask you. And then he asks him some very basic questions. And as God asks some simple questions, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? If you're so bright, let me know. Um, how is it that the waves and the, and the sea rush up to the shore, go no further, and stop at a certain place? If you know, can you please tell me? Some very basic things that only God would really be able to answer, he asked that of Job. And Job's response is no longer asking questions of God, but simply saying, uh, to, in, in effect, I put my hand over my mouth. Uh, I mourn over what I have done. I, I should be in sackcloth and ashes. I have spoken without knowledge, you know, and truly I see who you are and who I am. Because when God begins to ask us questions, we have to put our hands over our mouths and be quiet because we can't answer the questions. Well, you have Pontius Pilate asking a question of Jesus, are you king of the Jews? But Jesus answers him and actually interrogates him, are you speaking for yourself about this or did others tell you this concerning me. So, Jesus actually turns it around. Is this the result of your own curiosity? Or have you been fed information concerning me? Is this something that you've wondered? You've heard of my activities. You know, I've been here and busy for the last three years doing quite a number of things that have obviously come to your ears. There have been miracles and teachings. There have been multitudes following me. You're the Roman governor. You're aware of what's taking place. You know when there are multitudes of people who are assembling. You, you've heard the stories. There's no doubt that, that uh, Pontius Pilate had his spies. There's no doubt that he had people out there feeding him information. He's heard plenty. There's no doubt about that. He's heard plenty about this. And so this is what's important, guys. This is something that's very important for us. The more you know, the more accountability you have to explain to God. The more you know. You go to a Bible study, you hear things about the Lord, things that you hadn't known before or heard about before. You leave that Bible study in greater accountability to God because you know more about Him because you spent time hearing the Bible talk. And so, it's not really a safe thing to receive information concerning God and not to act on it. It never is. Because the more you know, the more you owe. And so, Pilate has heard plenty, and so Jesus is basically saying, are you asking this because you're interested, or are you asking this because others have fed you information? Well, our Pilate's answer is very clear when he says to him, in response, in verse 35, am I a Jew? That's another way of saying this is something that only Jewish people would be interested in. I, this is not something that interests me at all. Are you kidding me? 
And so what he's speaking about is he's saying, I'm really not that interested. He's saying, verse 35, your own nation and the chief priests deliver you to me. What have you done? I'm not interested in this. I'm a governor, not a priest. So Jesus responds, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. If I were an earthly king, my first priority would be to have a, a military that is surrounding me and defending me. You know, the president of the United States doesn't walk out of, out of the White House, you know, and go shopping down the street by himself. His kids can't walk out there and go to school on the, by themselves. They don't climb on a, a, a bus, a, a public bus with a lot. They don't do that. They are constantly surrounded by bodyguards. Even after the, the father has left his, his, his uh, office of president, they will have um, a servicemen uh, uh, attendant to their needs for the rest of their life. They will always have somebody guarding them. That's just the way it is in, in, in that kind of uh, political society and all. That's the way it works. There are always bodyguards. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Listen, if I were a, an earthly king, I would have servants surrounding me. It would be a military organization. They would not allow me to be delivered to you. My servants would have been fighting to deliver me from you uh, and, and from the Jewish nation. But now he's saying, my kingdom's not from here. My kingdom is not modeled after the kingdoms of the world. You see, Romans 14, verse 17 says, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's spiritual in nature. And so Pilate, hearing him speaking like that, my kingdom says in verse 37, he says to him, are you a king then? Well, Jesus' response to that in just a moment will show. Because when he says, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause, I was born. And for this cause, I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. This is one of those scriptures where the Lord Jesus Christ tells you clearly why he came. Clearly, I bear witness to the truth. That's why I have come. Well, the point he's making is it is by truth alone that I influence the minds and govern the manners of my subjects. Is truth important, guys? Is, is truth important? Absolutely. Absolutely. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Truth makes you free. Because truth brings you into a state of liberty. One famous dictator said, I can take a man's freedom, but I cannot take a man's liberty. Because you can be free even though you're in a jail cell. You can be free because freedom is not simply something that is physical in nature. Freedom is something that takes place when you have a relationship with God and he sets you free from your sins. I was a young man. I was in a college class. Each student in the class was assigned the task of standing before the class, being given a word by the professor, and then extemporaneously to speak on that particular word. I was in a secular college at that time, and so I sat in the class week after week until it was my opportunity. I'm one of these students when I was a young man I would be in the class, and I was one of those students that didn't really speak unless I was spoken to, didn't open my mouth unless was required of me, or the situation dictated that that is something that perhaps I should speak at, speak about. So in this particular class, it was a political science class, I really didn't 
have anything to say. So I was there in class, you know, three days a week for the first several weeks of class, and it would, it, I hadn't been assigned to speak yet. And so I'm one of these quiet guys who was just there, never saying anything. Well, it's my turn to speak, and the professor says, Dave, it's your turn. Um, would you please come up? So I come walking up and stand before the class, 25, 30 kids. And he says, the word that I'm assigning for you to speak is on freedom. And so I'm there. I was 24 years old. I'm in class in secular college. And I said, when you use the word freedom, I said something like this. When you use the word freedom, there are various ways that people use that word. The word that I like to associate or the thought I like to associate with that word freedom is freedom from sins because the Lord Jesus Christ died on a cross so that I might have freedom through the truth that he gives to us in the gospel. And I preached the gospel for the five minutes that I was assigned in that class because that's really what freedom is. It's freedom from the sin, the bondage that you find yourself under because the Lord Jesus Christ said that a man who sins is a slave to that sin. And, and, and Jesus Christ said, I can set you free. So when Jesus came, he brought the gospel of truth because it's the truth that sets people free. And that's why Jesus is saying, uh, the one is of who, who, everyone who is of the truth will hear my voice. He said, I have come in order that I might speak concerning what truth is. It's, it's by truth alone that I influence the minds. It's, it's by truth that I govern the lives of people. And, and those who are pursuing me will hear my voice. That's what he said in John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. So when Jesus says that, he says, I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate, at that point, just opens his heart. What is truth? In other words, I'm not one of your followers. For me, there's really no such thing as truth. You have your truth. These people have their truth. I, I've heard so many philosophers over a lifetime of government service. I have come to the conclusion that there's no such thing as truth. I have no interest in pursuing dialogue with you. I have no desire to converse with you concerning what you teach and what you believe or what these people believe. You know, I, am I a Jew? That doesn't matter to me whatsoever. I don't desire to hear the truth. I don't desire to have a relationship with you. I don't desire to know these things. And, and you know, all of us know we have had people who are friends in our lives, family members sometimes, who are just like that. I don't want to hear it. I mean, it's fine for you. It's good for you. I'm glad it made you happy. You know, you want to be a Christian, that's all right. Just don't push me. Just don't bother me. Just don't be telling me I don't want to hear it. That's the same attitude that Pontius Pilate had. You've got your truth, I've got my truth, as if truth is something that you can just determine on your own. It's not objective, it's not outside, it's from the inside. Now, truth is something that is revealed. Because we live in darkness, Jesus brings light. Pontius Pilate says, I'm not interested in this. We have stood... As a matter of fact, every time we go to Israel, we stand in the actual site where Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate. I've taught this passage in the Praetorium, standing there with people, sharing this one thing. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And we speak about the truth that has made us free. And I've, and I've told my Jewish friends, the, the only reason that we have any love for Israel at all the only reason that we support and love Israel and come here by the busload is because of a Jewish man named Jesus Christ who has changed our heart towards this nation and has opened our hearts to love you and to love the people of Israel. We come because we have been set free by the truth that was given to us by our rabbi, Jesus of Nazareth, you see. Pontius Pilate, on the other hand, I don't want anything to do with you. When he had said this, according to verse 38, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. So, as you look at this, one, you see that Pontius Pilate refused personal responsibility about making a decision concerning Jesus Christ. But the bottom line is people are held responsible concerning how they view him. We see also that he was seeking a way out of any entanglement with Jesus because he wanted to limit his accountability. But once you've encountered him, 
you're held accountable for your response. And then finally, we see that he rejected Jesus' invitation to investigate his claims more closely. And so we must not close our hearts to investigating the claims that Jesus made. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Is that true or is that not true? But after this has taken place, he went out and he said, I find no fault in him. My judgment, there's no legal charge that can be rendered against this man. And so that's what's taking place as we go back and conclude in Luke 23. Let's turn our Bibles back there. And that's what's happening in verse 4 when Pilate said to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no fault in this man. Verse 5, but they were the more fierce, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. Pilate doesn't want any more problems. When he's telling them, I find no fault, they get fierce, they get angry, and they continue. He stirs up the people while well, he's concerned about this. You see, at this time, he's been governing Judea for around five years, and he had misjudged the Jews before. Uh, once he had offended them deliberately by having his soldiers carry Roman banners with an image of Caesar, and the Jews considered the images blasphemous and asked for their removal, and when he refused to remove them, he herded a delegation of Jews into an amphitheater and threatened to behead them. They bared their necks, threw themselves on the ground, and defied him. So he removed the banners. Another time he took money forcefully from the tre uh, tre treasury of the temple to build an aqueduct, and the Jews openly rioted, and Pilate slaughtered many of the protesters. And finally, he had special shields made for the guard of the Antonia Fortress with images of Tiberius Caesar engraved on the shields. And this time, the Jewish leaders protested directly to Caesar, and Caesar ordered him to remove the shields immediately. He didn't want any more problems with Israel. He didn't want any more problems with his people. And there they are getting the more fierce and saying, he's stirring up the people. He's teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to the... Now, when they said Galilee, as he's looking for a way out, they provide him with some temporary relief because they mention Galilee. And we're going to see next time we get together what he does when he hears, oh, He's been in Galilee because he thinks he's finding a way out of his responsibility at the mention of that place. So we'll close here, and next time we're together, we'll see exactly what takes place. When the Lord speaks to our hearts, gives us information about him, it's not just because he feels like giving us information. When the Lord gives us information concerning himself and his ways and the things that he demands and requires for man, he's doing that so that we can respond in faith and obey. That's why he does it. Pontius Pilate thought that he could just stand there, this itinerant Jewish rabbi, a little bit of a troublemaker, but not too much of a trouble to him. He thought that he could deal with them without any problems. But he's going to discover that you can't deal with Jesus without problems. You have to make a decision. Just who is he? Is he who he says he is or is he not? If he is, we bow our knees to him. If he's not, we have no need to. As it was once said, either he is a liar or he is a lunatic or he is the Lord. Those are your only three choices. And for us who are believers, he's the Lord.